clear history before Allen Bob. Okay. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. And what, about what year is, are you going to start at? Just so I get perspective. I'm going to start at. Let me think a second now. Uh, I'm going to start about somewhere around, I think, 1963 or something like that. So, one hair sticking up. Okay. One hair, okay. So, <clears throat> you can start. Okay, well, Triple I had sort of bootstrapped itself, and uh, uh, we had maybe doing consulting work and small contracts and so on, and we had maybe about uh, five or six people, uh, some were part time students uh, at MIT, graduate students, and so on. And one of those graduate students uh, told me one day that his uncle was at uh, Lehman Brothers and was into venture capital. And so I, after talking to him, I, he told me that, uh, he suggested that I send in a business plan to see if, if he would invest in the company. So I sent this business plan in and I made a business plan showing what I thought the company could do and blah, 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 you know. This was a long time ago. And I sent it in. I didn't hear anything for a few weeks, and then I got a short little letter back said, uh, thank you very much for sending the plan in, but uh, you know, here's what I want you to do. Try and do the same plan for half as much money. So I thought, that's a little weird, but anyway, so it seemed like an exercise. So I, you know, so I was always a bit flippant about almost everything. So I tried to do it for half as much money, and so it was easy to make a plan for half as much money. So I then said, well, let me try that again. <laughs> I said, if I can go half the half. And then I went half the half of that half, and so on. And finally I decided, okay, I don't need any money at all. And that was the end of that. So about two or three years later, I'm at a party, actually at Marvin Minsky's house for some reason. The, the student was named Paul Abrahams. He later became a professor at BU long later after he did a PhD thesis for me when I was a professor at MIT. That's how long it took him. Anyway, um, I ran into this guy and he, it turned out he was the guy at Lehman Brothers I'd sent this thing to. So I said, you know, I sent you this business plan and you may not remember it, uh, but, you know, I tried to describe it. And he said, well, what's your question? And I said, well, you said, um, you know, see if you can do for half the money. I wonder why you said that. And he laughed and he said, look, I, I had a policy. I always acted the same way. What's that? I told my secretary to put the plan on the shelf and three weeks later send a letter asking if it can be done for half the money. And then if the person said yes, then he'd read it. Anyway, I don't know if he got rich or went broke, but I thought that was funny. That was just a little incident along the way. Let me see what else I made some notes here. Oh, one of the first contracts I got was from uh, ARPA. I got a contract from ARPA. Now, that wasn't so unusual because my ex-boss at Bolt, Baranek & Newman, where I worked, had gone to ARPA to make time-sharing happen. Time-sharing was an idea of John McCarthy's. John McCarthy was this fantastic inventive guy, inventive guy. <clears throat> and he came up with a, uh, an idea of people sitting at a computer and doing things with it, <laughs> kind of the way all computers are used today. Oh, that doesn't sound, but the only problem was that a computer that could do something interesting cost about five million bucks when he came up with the idea, like an IBM 709 or something, which was still a vacuum tube computer. 
<clears throat> and it was a large computer, and the way it worked was you typed up your program on, uh, onto a, you had a, you, you wrote it out on a special pad which had a form. Here's the address part, here's the opcode part, here's the, uh, no, the location part, opcode part, the address part, the index register part, and then comment part and so on. You'd just fill this out. You'd give it to a key punch person who would key punch it on IBM cards, one card per instruction. You'd get a deck of cards. You would submit it for a run. You'd bring it into the computer center. The next day you'd come back to find out and if you, if you did it right and you had a printout part that printed out something and your program worked, you would find that out. If it didn't, you eventually learned to always print something out, you know, and so on. And one, the turnaround time between you type something and you get a response was 24 hours at best. This is the way computers all over the country were run. Now, uh, <clears throat> John McCarthy's idea was that the computer is fast enough that it could pay attention to one person, then switch to another and another and another so rapidly that each person could feel he had, he was, he had the computer to himself. And John invented something called um, uh, certain registers that would uh, prevent your program from stepping on the data of another program so that if your program went crazy, it wouldn't affect the other programs. They were called boundary registers. And he invented another idea, relocation register, which was a register so your program would think it's in a particular place in memory, even though it was in a different place in memory. So he came up with all these hardware ideas to make this possible. He told me all that, and he had started a project at, at uh, uh, MIT to have that happen. MIT didn't think much of John McCarthy. Uh, he was in the electrical engineering department and as far as they concerned this was a stupid idea. You know, most people thought it was a stupid idea, even very smart people. And um, uh, the, um, so what happened is um, I started Triple I and John had told me that idea while I was at, at Bull Peranic and Newman and we started to, I had figured out a way to do his thing on the little PDP-1 easily because the hardware mods were easy to make and so on and that was done successfully. So it sort of demonstrated that John's idea worked. And uh, so uh, when I started Triple I, I had John become one of the directors and also uh, Marvin Minsky became a director and Oliver Selfridge because I was interested in artificial intelligence and I had the three best people in the world in artificial intelligence and if anyone had done AI in those days and got it done it would have been us but they haven't done it yet so I'm glad we didn't concentrate on that. So in any case they were three of the directors and me. I have to tell one anecdote. We held our board meetings usually at a, there was a fancy restaurant on, in Boston, very fancy restaurant, and they had private dining rooms upstairs. So we would hold our board meetings in the private dining room upstairs. One day we're all walking there and uh, we noticed John doesn't have a tie. And this restaurant wouldn't allow you in without a tie. So I said, John, you gotta have a tie. So we stopped in a store and uh, I said, told John he had to buy himself a tie. So John's in the store and suddenly he says, you pick out a tie. I said, I don't want to pick out a tie. He says, you pick the tie. So I said, that one. Okay. So John puts the tie and he says, let it be known that the director, of, the chairman of the board of Information International is such an authoritarian guy, he has to select the ties for the board members. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Typical John McCarthy joke. So <clears throat> anyway, um, you know, our company um, had all these fortuitous things happen. 
just wonderful things. And um, one of them uh, was the, um, uh, that Ben Gurley, whom I um, kind of, he, he was, to me, he was one of, the, there were two fantastic computer designers I knew. I considered them to be the two best designers in the world. One was Ben Gurley, the other was John Cock. And Ben Gurley was the absolute master of simplicity. The PDP-1 was a revolutionary design. It was very simple and uh, straightforward. And, you know, it cost a little over $100,000. And it, at BBN, we had an LGP-30 that we paid $50,000 for. The LGP-30 we paid $50,000 did 60 instructions a second, six zero. The PDP-1 we paid $100,000 did 100,000 instructions a second. That's quite a jump for a little bit of money. And, uh, you know, uh, so... And, uh, you know, it was like a almost magic thing. The wonderful thing about uh, in my relationship with, um, with uh, Ben Gurley was this. Um, first of all, I have to tell you how I met him, because that's a funny story. Um, and um, this is before I started the company, so that may be a little out of place, but I want to tell this one story quickly. There was a 1959, uh, I think it was, was it 59 or 69? Spring Joint Computer Conference, 1959. Spring Joint Computer Conference. And um, it was in Boston. I went to it and, uh, you know, there were these exhibitors there. And there was a tape drive manufacturer. And this tape drive uh, was, uh, you know, some company, they were trying to copy IBM's tape drives. And they had like about uh, one horsepower motors on the reels with the vacuum columns. You remember those kind? Where the tape went down a vacuum column and back up across the heads, down a vacuum column and back up to insulate the, the motors. So the motors would go twist you know, fast up there, and the tape is moving slowly through it, and anyway, anyway. And next to it is this PDP-1. It's like a, I saw this machine, and my eyes just about popped out of my head. It had a display scope, and they had programs displaying stuff in real time. I realized, wow, this is a fast computer. It's, you know, doing all this stuff. So I started talking to uh, Ben Gurley about the computer, and then the computer just suddenly drop dead. And Ben Gurley curses and starts the computer up again. You know, this was the prototype. And then it runs a while, and then it drops dead, you know. So, but in any case, I'm fascinated by it, and I decided I had to have one. So I'm walking away, and I see the, there's this guy with the tape drives there. And, I, and he says, you want to see this drive? You know, and, he, and this motor goes crunch with the tape drive, and twists fast, and, you know, really using a lot of power. And I'm thinking, I, so I'm sort of looking at the tape drive and looking at the computer. There's Ben Gurley at the display screen. And the guy says, watch this. And he does it, and the computer there stops. When the guy turned the tape drive on, Ben Gurley's computer stopped. So I go looking, and I see a, um, a, um, what was used to shield a giant cable, it was a uh, open flat conductor that you could open up and put another cable inside for shielding, but it was just empty. And I said, what to the tape drive guy, what's that? He said, oh, I needed a ground, you know, in those days. So, so I, I decided I'd follow it around to see where it was connected to ground. It wasn't, it just went to the PDP-1 because they wanted a ground. <laughs> So when I showed that to Ben, uh, he was very appreciative because <laughs> he didn't, he hadn't figured. <clears throat> now, I credit that with one thing. 
I kept making suggestions to Ben, and he kept taking them. I'd say, you know, this computer ought to have an execute instruction. He said, okay. So I would, I would say, the computer ought to have such and such. He'd say, okay. And the next, and so he changed the design of the computer and so that when we ordered one, I had specified about five different instructions I wanted. I wanted a different printer. I wanted a this, that. He did it all. And I was like, and uh, I had previously at times talked to IBM and said, hey, you know, you really ought to do something with this computer. And they say, you want us to do something special for that one, you know? And they think of some enormous price and it was all crazy. So this was a, a whole revel re revelation for me. So <clears throat> when I left BBN to start Triple I, I was located in the Mill and Maynard. And I was a software guy, basically, even though I was interested in hardware. And uh, so I wrote, they wanted to have, commercially, they wanted an algebraic compiler. So I designed an algebraic compiler. And uh, I started DECUS, which was their users group for Digital Equipment Corporation. I just, because uh, I copied the LGP30 users group idea. <laughs> and uh, started that. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I was generally helpful to them. They, they, wanted a, they wanted a set of double precision floating point software, you know, so I wrote that. That was interesting because um, uh, the computer did not have a multiply or divide instruction. It had something called multiply step. And, uh, uh, so when I was at, at when I started the company, and uh, I was doing that work for digital, uh, I they had a subroutine for multiply and a subroutine for divide, and by that time there were about 25 PDP ones in the world, and they wanted floating point. So I said, okay, I'll write that. So I'm kind of methodical. So after I wrote this floating point algorithm, I, I uh, uh, wrote a test routine, which is I found, you know, multiply A times B, and then, you know, uh, see if I get the right answer, and then vary it a little bit this way. and vary it. So I wrote a program to test the the operations and something was wrong. I kept get, it, it, I couldn't get my program to work right. So I investigate, investigate, and my program used some programs that a guy named Alan Tritter wrote at BBN to do multiply and divide, and those programs were distributed with the PDP-1. So the 23 machines out in the field all used Alan Tritter's programs for multiplying them. So I finally tracked it down to there was an error in the divide routine. <laughs> so all the machines in the field and digital had eventually implemented a divide instruction. They copied Tritter's program. All of them had that same error in it which I found by checking out the floating point things, so they had to fix all those, and so on. Those are little things that, you know, happen. Uh, uh, can I ask you a couple sure, of Sure, go when ahead. You, you, when you're on, on the subject of MIT, um, did you know Stephen Coons? No. Did you ever run into uh, Ivan Sutherland? Yes. Can you talk Plenty. about that? Sure. Uh, Ivan Sutherland was a student and, um, and when I was in business, okay, and he was a grad student at MIT, and he did his thesis. I don't remember who his thesis supervisor was. It might have been Minsky, was it? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, what he did was he did his thesis on TX2, uh, which was he did, it was called, I think of it a name. He did, what he did was computer-aided design, CAD-like. Uh, not take it back, drawing, uh, getting images on a, and working with perspectives and, and, and images on a uh, computer screen 
and he found very general mathematical ways to do coordinate conversions to get perspective views from different directions. Uh, he pioneered in using, uh, what's it called, uh, where you, it's not something like uniform, some kind of coordinates. Um, I forget the name for it, but uh, it's a kind of different coordinate system and things like that that made the computations easier. So he did this thing and the program was called, the thesis was called? Sketchpad. Sketchpad, that's it, right. And he made himself famous that way because he was on the ball and did something good. So I, I knew him at that time. He was one, everybody knew everybody in those days. <laughs> But there were so few of us. So Information International started out uh, kind of, you know, slow and grew mostly consulting and doing things, but I fell into this graphics area just naturally. One of the things that uh, I had an advantage is most people would look at some problem like character recognition, and they would come up with what seemed to me to be crackpot ideas right away. I'll never forget, as long as I live, I visited the senior sort of design engineer guy at uh, the, what was the premier Linotype company, Linotype. Okay, that was the company that made the machines that put the type. He was going to do OCR, and he's, he was an older guy, and he said to me, you know, how many, if we're going to scan a character, how many lines would you have to scan across the character to be able to recognize him? And I said, oh, quite a few, blah, 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 you know. He said, ha, huh, you're wrong. And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, because I've done some tests and you don't need to. You can do it with just, if you just scan it, maybe four lines, that's enough. I said, that sounds very strange to me. So he says, I have proof. I said, well, I'd like to see it. So he then did something. Uh, at Linotype, they had these beautiful cards that would have one character on the card, you know, like a two. So the font definitions were on these beautiful big cards. So he had made some transparencies with bars, like it might be a half-inch bar, a space, a half-inch bar and a space, and, you'd, and he would put it over the character. So now you had this, you're looking at this, say it's a two, okay, and some of it's invisible, one one inch bar is invisible, and then you have one inch clear, and so on and so forth. And he said, see, it's obviously it's a two. He put it over it. Okay. Now, you, you know, if you just saw one corner of the two in high depth, like you see,